Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Pump. Today we speak to our good friend and author of Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, Mike Matthews about how to gain 10 pounds of pure muscle in 90 days. Mike Matthews. What's up, friends? All right. Is it possible to gain 10 pounds of lean body mass in 90 days? Yes, with an asterisk. <laughs> right. Because like, who are we talking about? Are we talking about somebody who's brand new to strength training? That's pretty straightforward, right? Mm. Um, male versus female, we'd have to we'd have to make that distinction too. Uh, but but your average guy just getting into strength training, I, I think that pretty much everybody can do that. Yeah. Now, take a guy though who's been lifting weights for several years. He's pretty strong now. He's gained a fair amount of muscle. I think it's probably still possible, uh, but it's a lot more difficult. And even with that more experienced weightlifter, we have to talk about, well, when we say lean mass, are we talking about actual like contractile muscle tissue, or are we also talking about fluid expansion as well? Right? You also have to talk about where he's at in his journey, because actually that guy that would also be the most challenged because he's been lifting for years, had he just come off of a break of not lifting sure. for like yeah. three to six yeah. months, yeah. he actually would be at an advantage yeah. because he had built that in the past to gain that. Well, so the before and after scam, the D train. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a good one. All right, well, I mean, before we even get into that, um, it's first off, why would anybody even want to do this? Well, aside from the obvious, you know, people who want to build muscle, um, it's a great way to boost your metabolism. Lean body mass looks good. Uh, it improves insulin sensitivity. It, it sculpts and shapes your body. Of course, I've talked about how it increases your, your ability to burn calories. So if you want to get lean, so anybody listening who just wants to burn body fat, this strategy in the short term is a great way to improve your odds at long-term body fat. Now, what I, what I think I want to add to what you were saying earlier is it's hard. Building muscle isn't uh, easy at all. Um, because of all, most all of what I mentioned, but primarily because muscle is expensive tissue. So your body's not trying to become more calorie dependent unless it thinks it has to. So this is why building muscle is so hard. And once you build a certain amount of muscle, it gets harder and harder. Like if I gain 10 pounds of muscle, you know. Geometrically harder. I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's like significantly harder. Yeah the longer you strength train um, and the longer you do this, like like I said- In the context cool. that you are consistent at the time. Right, yeah. right, right, right. right. Yeah. Um, so it's really hard, but there's a lot of things that play a, a role in this. Um, you know, male versus female, how experienced you are, genetics. Mm. Boy, does that play a huge role. I remember the first time I was exposed to superior muscle building genetics. I was managing a gym and I had this guy that uh, worked for me. He used to clean the gym. So he cleaned the gym and he didn't make a lot of money and he just, he was super muscular and I'd watch him every once in a while go out and work out and he would do skull crushers with 225 and I'd watch him eat and he'd eat like a 99 cents cheeseburger. He'd eat a couple pop tarts. And this is when it dawned on me. Oh, there's a whole nother level of, <laughs> of muscle building genes out there. So, mm -hmm. but that all being said, um, what we're, I think what I want to say here is what we're going to talk about. Anybody could apply to build the most amount of muscle yeah. that they can personally build in that 90 day process. Does yeah. that sound, does yeah. it sound fair yeah. to you guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and to give a little bit of context to that. So somebody who works with me, he did, I think he lasted, maybe he made it eight weeks on this program. So a pretty experienced weightlifter when he did this, he had already squatted 405. So he's a strong, oh, already strong. A, and, and, and at a body weight of probably like 170, he's not a very big guy. He's, you know, he's not very tall. Um, but pretty experienced weightlifter. And in about eight weeks, he gained about eight pounds, wow. a little bit of, uh, a little bit of body fat. Of course, there's definitely, there was definitely more fluid. I mean, he was eating uh, about a thousand grams of carbs a day and he was keeping his fat under 80 grams a day, which is, uh, that's, that's, that's a feat. How actually. the hell did he do that? Uh, he, he, a lot ate, of rice? he ate a lo a loaf of bread every day and he would eat a huge bowl of pasta every day with like low fat, gross, tastes like nothing watered down sauce, right? Okay. Um, and lean protein. So he was very meticulous with his diet and his training program though. Uh, he was doing two a days, five days a week. And that's simply because to, to, to get in enough volume to, to grow like that. I mean, he had to be in the gym three hours a day. And so he did that. And, um, 
again, about, I think it was about eight pounds gained. Let's just say six pounds of that probably was quote unquote lean mass, even though some of that is just going to be extra fluid in his muscles. And which but, adds to the size and shape of your yeah, muscles. Yeah, for too. sure, for yeah. sure. But, you know, often when people think gaining lean mass, gaining muscle, yeah. they don't necessarily think, oh, well, I'm just going to stuff some more fluid in my muscles to make them look bigger. Like they're thinking this is, this is the solid dense, contractile. Yeah. yeah, contractile. Yeah, uh, no, I'm glad you said that. Lean but he, mass. But the, after that, everything was hurting. And this is when he was in his, he was like 24. So he was invincible, you know, physically. And he, and he couldn't do it for more than, uh, six, seven, eight weeks because everything was hurting. Yeah. Lean mass refers to anything that's not body fat. Right. What's up, everybody? I got a giveaway today as usual. But before I do, our Black Friday sale still going on. And then it's going to go into Cyber Monday, which ends the second. OK, this means 60 percent off any MAPS workout program and 60 percent off any MAPS workout program bundle. So across the board, 60 percent off. Here's how you can do it. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Use the code Black Friday if it's still Black Friday. If it's after Black Friday, but before the second of December, then use the code Cyber Monday. Nonetheless, both of those give you 60% off any and all workout programs and bundles. All right, here's the giveaway. I'm going to give away another super bundle. Here's how you can win a super bundle. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Uh, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. And then if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. And then boom, you got free access to the super bundle. All right, here comes the show. Now, I want to touch on something without getting too deep in the weeds, um, but I do want to touch on something. You said he was doing two workouts a day. Yep. You know, what's interesting about that. We we just created a program called uh, MAPS 15. This is for, this is, and we put an advanced version in there, but for the average lift, average person trying to work out, it's 15 minutes every day, which equates to like 250 something minute workouts a week or whatever. We have an advanced version there, but what we found is when you take what we found and also data seems to support this when you take your total volume and just break it up into smaller workouts you seem to build more muscle and bodybuilders and strength athletes have known this for a long time i know olympic lifters have done this forever you know first uh originating in the soviet union when they would just kick our ass and weightlifting have you experimented with anything like that where you instead of doing your whole workout i know you have a crazy schedule you're one of the hardest working people i know have you ever tried something like this um not not to the degree that you're talking about. And, uh, there, there's certainly, so, so my, my position on, on frequency and my understanding of the research, at least as it stands right now, is that, um, particularly with experienced weightlifters, uh, higher frequency, it wins to a point, mm -hmm. um, like training each major muscle group two or three times per week is probably better than training, let's say one time a week. Right. Although that's not that's hard to do if you're doing compound lifts, right? Because you're training multiple major muscle groups with those lifts. Yes. But to keep it simple, um, I would agree that two to three times per week for major muscle groups that you want to grow, if you're an experienced weightlifter, is, is probably superior to one. You also kind of have to do that because of the, the, the amount of volume. So take my body, right? Yeah. Uh, if I want to get bigger and stronger and, and my genetics are not going to allow for much more of anything. But if I really, and, and I have been pushing it pretty hard for two years, although I dialed it back a little bit recently, um, I, it takes, let's just say 15 to 16 hard sets per week for, for any major muscle group to make any progress for me to gain any strength, for example, and gain any size to get anywhere. You figured that out for yourself. Yeah. 10, 10 sets per week, for example, let's say my chest, I just want more chest. 10 sets per week will not do it. I can maintain, of course, what I have, but if I want to make any progress, I have to do upward of 15 or 16 hard sets for my pecs. Right? Now, the interesting part, have you also pushed the opposite into that spectrum and know that, oh, once I start going in the 25 to 30 sets. And then I you go, just get hurt. <laughs> yeah, negative right. results. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the hardest things about what we're talking about right now is finding that sweet yep. spot is because a lot of times people hear something like that and they go, oh, okay, more is better. Yep. And it's mm -hmm. like, that's not necessarily true because there's definitely, you know, like this bell Diminishing curve. returns. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. After you get- That's probably 20 or 25 is, uh, you know, that's Lyle, Lyle McDonald has been saying this for at least a decade now. Yeah. He's been saying- up to 20 to 25 hard sets per week. If you're an advanced weightlifter and you're really going for it beyond that, you're probably just going to get hurt. So even if more volume, even if there were a linear relationship between volume and hypertrophy, you're just going to get hurt and you can't build muscle when you're hurt. So, um, so to that point of frequency, okay, I'll say I'm going to do 15 hard sets for my pecs. I'm going to really go for it uh, per week. Should I do that in one session? Right. No. 
because for a couple of reasons. One is research shows that once you get beyond probably 10, eight to 10 sets for any individual major muscle group in one workout, the hypertrophic response, the muscle building signal gets muddied and you are not going to get the response that you would get if you were to take, let's say those 15 sets and do them over two, three workouts. Right. Now, someone like Menno Henselman's is big on very high frequency, even six to seven days training a muscle group, six to seven days per week. So you might do the same amount of volume, but now you're only doing a few sets per session. Right. right? And that's, that's an approach I have not tried myself. And uh, that's closer to what he's talking about. Correct. The mass 15. Yep, it's, yep. I, I just, it's, I'm three months into experimenting. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, yep. it's, it, it's interesting. You know what it feels like, Mike, I'd love your opinion on this. Um, cause I, you know, like we've talked many times, I've been on your show many times. You're, you're one of the smarter people in our space. It feels like long rest periods. So I'll do three sets for chest today, three mm -hmm. sets tomorrow. So it's like, I do the three sets. Those three sets have short rest periods. The next day, it's almost like a long rest period to the next workout. And it mm. almost feels that way when I'm working out. It's very, very interesting. It feels different. And I almost feel like there's two things. One, I can get away with more volume if I wanted to. And two, I can also get away with less volume if I wanted to because of the increased frequency. I would love for you to try experimenting with that because I'd love your opinion. You're very objective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I think there are good evidence-based arguments for increasing frequency beyond that two to three times per week. That, yeah. That's kind of the traditional, I would say, currently evidence-based approach to training frequency is to look at it more as a tool for increasing volume. So if you need to get to 20 hard sets for, let's say yeah. you're like a natural bodybuilder and you are really trying to gain every last ounce of muscle and strength available to you, your legs are big, but they need to be a little bit bigger. That's, you know, a weak point according to the judges. And you're going to have to blast yourself 20 hard sets for your lower body per week. And let's say with fairly heavy, heavy weight, like you're never doing more than 10 or 12 reps per set that's difficult. Um, yeah. and, and you're going to have to break that up into several workouts. Trying to do that in one workout is maybe rhabdo territory. You might end up <laughs> in the hospital, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that question though of, okay, sh should you do, um, should you do 10 sets twice a week? Should you do like six or seven sets three times a week? Yeah. Or should you do what you're talking about? Maybe you're going to train lower body four or five times per week, uh, but you're only doing uh, four or five sets per workout. And I know that there are, you know, smart people in the evidence-based community who would say that um, there's evidence to suggest that the higher frequency approach is superior to the moderate frequency yeah. approach. You know what else is interesting about that? Now, taking aside, we're talking about like advanced lifters or yeah. ourselves, very experienced. You talk about the average Joe, average Jane or Joe. Here's the, another just kind of, you know, thing to throw into the mix that, that, complicates things a little bit, but in, in my opinion, actually makes things a little bit more clear. It's easier for the average person to exercise consistently when you give them short daily workouts versus infrequent longer workouts. Yep. Mm -hmm. At first glance, it doesn't seem apparent, right? Like, well, I mean, take two days a week and do an hour, two days. That should be easier for you to do. But in practice, people tend to do better when they do the, like, these little tiny workouts every single day that add up to roughly the same amount of time. So when you add that into it, it, it starts to become clear like, oh, I, I wonder if we're prescribing strength training to the average person who <clears throat> isn't necessarily a fitness fanatic, who doesn't love working out. Like maybe we've been prescribing it wrong all along. Maybe instead of saying, you know, do two or three days a week in the gym, what we should be saying is do, you know, two exercises a day. Yeah, this is where we talk about adherence, right? Like yeah. In, in terms of behaviors, like what's really going to stick, and that's really what's going to move the needle closer towards getting our goal of ten pound of muscle. Uh, at the end of the day, we could have all these techniques that you know we might see in a study that will play out that way. But if it's not going to play out in your lifestyle, yeah, it's not really. It's also it. more most likely to stick like a habit that way too. Yeah. And if you don't hit it a day or two, it's less detrimental than yeah. missing a full yeah. one hour workout. Missing your upper body day yeah, completely. you only do once or twice a week. Totally. Right. Totally. Now, right. what about, what about talking about adherence though? Um, you know, and I've, I've actually heard this over the years with some of the shorter workouts in some of the programs that I have, right. Where I would ask somebody to go to the gym and do a 30 to 45 minute workout. Yeah. Um, ironically, I would, I would hear from people fairly often, uh, one, they would, they would say they didn't feel like they did yeah. enough, mm -hmm. but then two, they're like, 
I drove to the gym, you know, I did that. That's, yeah. that's I should just spend more time here. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to drive a total of so what's your, maybe what, 60 minutes to do this short little workout and leave. You're right. What, what you're addressing was one of the, the greatest challenges that I went through, you mm-hmm. know, somebody who loves the train trains hour, hour and a half workouts all the time to cut down to something as short as 20 minutes like that. I would finish and feel like, I have so much more or right. I, I should do more. Or, oh my God. Am I even going to feel that the next day? And so there is that little bit of a uh, mental struggle that you have to go to and trust the process because then what you end up finding out is over time, not only do you, you feel okay. What I noticed the, the biggest thing that I noticed was uh, I was less likely to overreach. Mm-hmm. If I have an hour to train, uh, I, I, and I, no matter how long I've been doing this, I still tend to like, want to overeat. I'd rather, my theory was always, I'd rather overreach a little bit than to yeah. fall short type of attitude where this is a total different philosophy. And because of that, what I've noticed, especially being in my forties now, uh, my joints don't hurt. I feel my body feels good. And mm-hmm. so it's been a, it's kept me more disciplined about doing, uh, you know, not going over, overdoing it, which I had a tendency to do when I'm doing like, a, well, too, I've maybe a the catalyst right? over the last couple of years. And I've had to Dial it back a little bit. Yeah, it's it, well. Okay, so for, first off, it's always a mental hurdle. Um, Long term fitness is more mental than anything. Yeah, and one of the biggest hurdles is how people think they're supposed to feel after a workout. The people are led to believe that they should feel like they just survived battle at the end of a workout. I mean, in fact, some, some people, they, they use that, like that's the metaphor. Yes. Like, <laughs> come on. <we're>, we <laughs> yeah. picked some things up. We put them down. Yeah. We didn't exactly Stay engage yes. in hand-to-hand combat, mortal combat. Yeah, like, absolutely. <laughs> and, and so, and I know you've experienced this as well. You've been at this for a long time now too. You're a businessman. You're a father. You're very involved. The, the real way you should feel after a workout is you should feel better than you did going into it. Yep. You should actually feel more energized yep. and it should. And now why is this important? Well, two reasons. One, you get better results that way. That's a fact. If you consistently work out and feel better after your workout consistently, you're more likely to have trained appropriately over long periods of time. So that's number one. But number two, um, you're now making this something that is easier to develop uh, a good relationship with. If I always feel great after my workout, I'm more likely to look forward to it for five years, 10 years, 15 years. Versus like, dreading it. I don't care who you are. Yeah, you, you that initial three-month period of motivation where you're hating your body and you feel you're so fat and whatever, it may be cathartic to leave the gym and want to throw up and your legs are shaking. You got to go take a nap because you just killed yourself at first. But I guarantee you're not going to develop the kind of relationship with exercise that's going to last you forever. At some point, you're going to wake up in the morning and be like, oh, I don't want to do this crazy hard workout. It's way too much. And I didn't get good sleep and whatever yeah. versus, oh man, I'm not feeling too good. Oh, thank God I get to go to the gym and then I'll feel so amazing afterwards. So it's a total mental shift, but I think that's where, uh, I think where the answers are, are there. It's not necessarily, and we'll get to the mechanistic aspects of what we're talking about, but really the the juice, really where, where the real answers are, it's in the mental aspect. And how do we work around that? Well, let's let's get to that. I feel like we, we've talked about all yeah. the nuances. Yes. And, 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 and some takeaways. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We are now trying to build uh, the most amount of muscle in, the sh- in, in a 90-day period. And if we have to list off all the things that we find very important, like where do you focus on? I, I would say the first thing is you got to eat a lot. Let's talk about that mm. for a second, Mike. What is that? What do, what do we mean by when we say we need to eat a lot See, more specifically? Surplus. Yeah. Uh, totally agree. That means a consistent calorie surplus. It yes. means consistently eating more yes. calories than <laughs> you burn. Now, there is a, a debate about how much more, right? Mm-hmm. Are we talking about 5% more, 10% more, 30% more? And if we look at, there isn't too much research available on this, uh, unfortunately. There are some studies un- underway. Uh, I, I'm helping fund one that hopefully will. Oh, really? Yep. The, with Eric Helms being um, being done out of AUT University. Wow, that's on, awesome. On lean bulking in particular, right? That's However, the 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 evidence that we do have available suggests that uh, more calories beyond a point does not mean more muscle. Unfortunately, it just means more fat. Yeah. And so I've always recommended um, let's, let's say five to 10% more calories than you burn every day. And I like 10% more than five because five doesn't give you much wiggle room. Yeah. And we never know exactly how many calories we're burning Our right. caloric intake. Usually unless we are, um, 
very conscientiously weighing and measuring every single thing that goes into our body, our actual intake also fluctuates. So if we are trying to maximize muscle building, we do want to err on the side of maybe a little bit too much food rather than a little bit too little well, food. Well, especially with this avatar we're talking about right now because we're not talking about like general health or the average person we're like trying to build as yeah. much muscle yeah. As yeah this is like i came to you i said listen yeah. and I, if i'm coaching that person i'm definitely going to err on the side of you know over i'll yeah. worry about the couple extra pounds of body fat we right. put on later because this person is struggling with putting muscle on and they're trying to put on I'm as much so as i'm so glad you said right. that you are going to gain a little bit of body fat through this process if you go into this saying i'm going to want to gain a single ounce of body fat you're not going to build the most amount of muscle you can build within this 90 day period. Now we're not unless talking about, you're new, right? Because then no, that, thanks, there's yes. yeah, all kinds that of that still happens. might that still might <laughs> yeah. be true to yeah. a degree. But when you're new, your body is is so responsive to the training. Yes, I mean, how many over the years? How many amazing body recomps have you seen from people in their first year? Yeah, people where people build muscle almost doing anything in that first and month. drop fat. Yes, yes. Yeah. you know, like, which is why I think there's so many shitty programs out there. Yeah. <laughs> Because someone's like, it worked for me. It worked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, a, lot, yeah a lot of things can work. It's long you know, at that one, point. One thing you said that was real important is you emphasize the word consistently have a caloric surplus. Yes. This is the challenge because in my experience working with people that are struggling to pack on muscle, when they when I talk to them about eating and I go, okay, are you eating more than you're burning? Well, yeah, I eat a ton. And then we actually go and break it down. And what ends up happening is, you know, commonly Monday through Friday, they are eating 300, 400 calories above their their maintenance. Yep. Then Saturday and Sunday come along. And what tends to happen is they sleep in. They wake up, you know, two, three hours later. Um, now they're behind the eight ball. And then they try to make up for it by eating a little bit. Of it. But anyway, when you end up at the end of the week, you end up with a barely a surplus over the course of a week because Saturday, Sunday, they actually, their calories weren't high enough at all. And this actually happens for people trying to lose weight as well. Yep. They'll be in a great calorie deficit. Saturday and Sunday. Selective memory. They yeah. they remember the uh, thousand calorie Mondays, but they forget the four thousand calorie Saturdays. Yeah. Well, and because of that, wouldn't you guys say that this is another example too, where it, it's almost mandatory that this person tracks for me? Like if I'm coaching, if you're trying to this, maximize, oh, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah specific now, goal now like we should talk yes. about that. Why? Some people they ask me why, why, why track? And my answer, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, is because. Uh, unless you naturally just have a very big appetite, consistently overfeeding is actually kind of difficult. It is. You, you, it is. you quickly feel chore. like you are force feeding yourself because you kind of are. And, you know, we've all done it. And I can tell you, I remember the last time that I, I did a lean bulk. Uh, I was eating two dinners just because I needed to eat 4,000 calories a day. That's where I was at in it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I was full all of the time. I didn't really enjoy any of the food I was eating. <laughs> I, I, especially I was with forcing myself to especially eat Especially with nutrient-dense foods. Yeah. Because because they, you know why? Yeah, I wasn't psychologically, going to McDonald's three times. Yeah, yeah. psychologically, they all go like, I don't, I'm not going to have a problem eating 5,000 calories because they're yep. thinking of the time they crushed the whole bag of candy or the, you know, pizza, huge thing of, yeah, yeah. pizza or like that. You're not thinking about, you know, chicken thighs and white rice and sweet potatoes and vegetable. Like yep. you're not Getting thinking your like fiber and your nutrients. Yeah. yeah. Like when you eat like that, it is, we're well, trying to build muscle here. It is way more yes. difficult than you think to consistently day in and day out, stay in a surplus. And that's one of the strategies I would say, one of the most important strategies with being able to consistently hit your caloric targets, which in this case, Mike, I think you said it so well, about 10% over what you're burning. So if you're burning 2000 calories, you're going to try and eat 2200 calories to give you an example is to hit that number every day. Because what ends up happening is if you're off three days, you're going to try and make up for it now on another day. And now you run the risk. And here's the, a big challenge that I'd even highlight where when people try to make up for the fact that they missed a few days or whatever, they, they really overeat. They mess up their digestion. They get bloated. Mm -hmm. Try eating in a surplus when you're bloated. Good luck. That really sucks ass. So the key here with- And you end up just gaining more fat yes. on those days yep. than you need to. Because I, so go you into can't that. just make up for it like that. It doesn't work like that. Thank you. Get, yeah. go, into that, go into that for a second. So explain that a little bit. So you can't make up for the fact that you weren't in a calorie surplus for three days by by adding all those calories up and then doing it on that fourth day or whatever. Yeah. And and that is that is unfortunately, unfortunately the truth. I, I commented uh, on that 
just in the beginning of this uh, this discussion that, again, research shows, and, and I'm thinking of one study in particular that showed that a 30% calorie surplus, so eating 30% more calories than you burn every day, does not produce any additional muscle growth compared to 10%. And so- uh, and, So this and, is a day-to-day -day thing. Yeah. So, so it's just, you know, you can, uh, a small calorie surplus, we know that that aids in muscle building in different ways. I guess you could kind of say like your body's muscle building machinery, everything that goes into that just works best when energy is abundant, but going beyond that, let's say 10% surplus, it doesn't, it, the machinery can't work any faster. So right. all that happens is you just gain more fat. It's a, it's a bell curve. Can only we have, so we have the, at one point, at one place, it's peak, but as you start to go over that, yep. it starts to come back. Your body's down. just trying to capture yeah, it's excess energy, at that, energy at that point. And and so you, you can't make up for those days that you did not provide it the energy it needs to run that machinery uh, at full tilt, so to speak. And and those are in in a, in a sense those days are are lost opportunities for uh, for for muscle growth and if you if you try to compensate for that by eating a lot of food over let's say the weekend let's say the week what you didn't do mm. so great the weekend now you're gonna you're gonna try to really stuff your, yourself full of food uh, you will gain more let's say that's Saturday and Sunday you will gain more muscle on those days than let's say the Monday or Tuesday when you were actually in a slight deficit on accident uh, but you also are going to gain quite a bit of fat. Yeah. Overall, way less effective yeah. and it doesn't feel as good. No. All right. So what makes up calories obviously are the macronutrients. I think we should talk about yep. the, mo the most important one when it comes to muscle building. Not that it's the only essential one, but it's the most important one, uh, which is protein. And I typically will tell people to aim for one gram of protein per pound of, uh, of body mass in, in, in appropriately weight individuals. If you're obese, then you probably want to use lean body mass. Yep. How do you feel about, about that? Can't go wrong with yeah. that, right? And and you could go, especially if you're in a calorie surplus, you could probably go down to, let's say 0 0.8 grams per pound of body weight per day and, and see the same results. There's research to show that going above one gram per pound probably does not help you build more muscle. Yeah. Unfor unfortunately, it'd be nice if it were that easy. It's just a point, it's a stupid number. <laughs> so I'm it's serious. Even, yeah, yeah. I'm mean, trying to make it as simple as I can for a client, just telling them a one-to-one. Plus, one. people and, typically yeah. miss. And I actually heard someone say this Easy the other day that I thought was a, a better way of saying it, they, trying to explain. Because you saying something like, oh, a pound for every lean body mass, the person who doesn't understand that yep. doesn't know. So a similar way is your goal weight. So yeah, even if you are, say that. so even if you're 400 pounds, yeah. you, my, my goal is look to look at a healthy body. Comp. That's right. Yeah. What's, yeah. What's my goal weight? So that works for both ways. Yeah. Both oh, directions. I would be 180 pounds. That's Great. Right. Eat 180 that's grams. Right. Per oh, so very nice. That's a nice. Yeah. I, I like that. yeah I've also that. seen it re relevant to height. So one gram per centimeter in height seems to work. Oh, I've never, well. that one I've never yeah. seen. Yeah. Which that seems a little more. I think that, I think nothing can The goal weight, I agree, is about as easy as you can go. And it works. As long as they understand what goal weight means, we're talking about body comp. Let's look. Okay, you're 400 pounds. You yeah. are 62% body fat. Uh, you're a man. All right, where would you be at if you were at 15% body fat? We put some muscle on you. Yeah. Great. You're, you would weigh 180 pounds. Yeah. Coming back to that number. Right. Cool. There we go. Right. I like that. Okay, so we're hitting uh, roughly a gram of protein per pound of, of goal body weight. Yep. At that point, it's a lot of protein. Does the type of protein matter or does it matter more when the grams of protein are below that? Yeah, good question. And I'll make one more comment about the calories just because it might be helpful to people to, to understand if the range that they have come up with makes any sense. Most people, let's say they're they're physically active. Um, this is not walking, but this is like formal exercise, vigorous okay. activity. Let's say it's five-ish hours, three to five hours a week. For that person, they're probably going to have to eat somewhere around 17 to 18 calories per pound of body weight per day if they're in a normal body comp. So just, just putting that out there, that, okay. that's not a hard and fast rule. But if somebody's trying to work out their calories and it's coming in at like 12 per pound, that, that's almost like cutting calories. Something's okay. off. So Got just, it. just, just one, which I think is, I actually think that's the, the algorithm, both of our calculators use. I think you, we both, both yeah. companies have a calculator that you, if you're at this point and you're trying to figure out where should I start? Yeah. Although I always recommend, 
you know, figuring out your own baseline. Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Cause it's I just think, sometimes people that, you right. know, if you have no idea whatsoever, yeah, yeah. I think this is a great way you use the calculator to give you kind of a general idea. Yeah. But then I really think you should take a week to two weeks of consistency and go like, what's happening? Yeah, am I going yeah, up? Yeah. Am I going down? Am I maintaining? Well, coming back to protein. Yes. Uh, so, I think there's no question that the majority of that protein needs to be highly bioavailable. It needs to be rich in essential amino acids, particularly in leucine. And so that's that's primarily uh, animal derived protein. Plant based proteins are um, they're they're not missing amino acids. Some people claim that yeah. they're they're not incomplete. But many plant proteins, their essential amino acid profile, which these are the amino acids that we have to get from food. Our body cannot create them in any way is, uh, is lackluster, especially compared to animal proteins. And interestingly, research shows that even when you combine different sources of plant proteins to match the essential amino acid profile of whey protein, that the total amount of amino acids that make it into your blood, which is ultimately what matters, is significantly lower with plant protein versus whey, like 30 to 40% lower, matched for leucine, matched for total wow. essential amino acids. So there's probably something else going on here that we don't fully understand yet. And that's not to say that you can't do what we're talking about on a plant-based diet, but you actually might need to eat quite a bit more total protein than we're saying. I was just going right. to say, so that, to make if up it's for high that, enough, a bit more. then it'll make up the difference. But let's talk about bioavailability because that yeah. that's probably what's going on there, right? It yep. probably has to do with bio. What does that mean? What does bioavailable mean? Uh, just available for your body to use. Now with protein, again, what, what we really are interested in is the amino acids, particularly the essential amino acids. Leucine is very important. That's an essential amino acid that stimulates protein synthesis that actually like kickstarts the body's muscle building machinery, yeah. so to speak. And so those amino acids are, um, are, are digested, broken down, but they need to make their way into our blood so our body can use them. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of research on the bioavailability of different types of protein. Uh, like for example, uh, beef is quite high. It's, I think it scores in the range of like 80 to 90% of its bioavailable, mm -hmm. whereas hemp is, is, is pretty bad. It's, I think it's like 40 or 50 percent and so you have a you have a, a spectrum of bioavailability and total protein if you don't know that total protein can be a little bit misleading because if you're eating let's say you eat a lot of hemp protein for whatever reason like that's your protein powder and you're supplementing let's say you're getting 50 percent of your daily protein from a from a supplement and it happens to be a hemp protein yeah, or it's like it's inferior yeah or it's or it's hemp and it's maybe pumpkin seed which is also not very good maybe there's some pea protein in there which is a bit better rice protein a bit better uh but you're you're eating uh, let's say, and I'm, I'm thinking of women I've heard from over the years who are not naturally drawn to a high protein diet yeah. as it is. And they, so let's say you have a woman, she's a smaller woman. She wants to gain some, some muscle. And so she's like, all right, I don't want to do the one gram per pound per day. I'll do 0 0.8 grams. That I'll, let's say for simple math, she's a small small girl. She weighs a sure. hundred pounds just for simple. So 80 right? grams. Right. So she goes, all right, I'll, I'll do the, I'll do the 80 grams. Uh, but let's say 80% of that protein is low bioavailability that, that can get in the way. And to, 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 to fix that, she either is going to have to work in some higher bioavailability pro protein. Uh, so again, a lot of that's animal derived, or she might have to bump that up to one point three, 1.4 grams per pound of body weight per day to give her body, to make sure enough of these essential amino acids are getting into her blood so her body can use them. Now, wow. would you say too, like a digestibility in terms of like the protein source yep. plays a big factor in that? Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's, you know, there's the, what is it? Is it PDCAA is yeah. the, uh, is the acronym, but um, that's part of, Ultimately, I would say that comes under the heading of bioavailability, right? So the body has to be able to digest it and absorb it well enough to uh, yeah, get you, what it needs. You eat a protein that, that causes digestive issues. Your bioavailability yeah. goes you're not doing floor. so well. Yeah, you're not doing so good. This is where, especially if you're trying to gain, I think supplementation, uh, protein powder can be so invaluable for two reasons. One... Because uh, especially if you're if you're not taking in protein that is very bioavailable yeah. and super high quality, yeah. like maybe you, maybe uh, to speak to women, maybe you don't really like 
meat, for example, right. of any kind. You well, like I just wanted meat. to highlight the scenario that you're building is actually common. way more common than people think. Yeah. It's very yeah, common. It's very, and, not, and not just women. I've seen plenty of guys that were hard gainers. And part of the reason why they were hard gainers was they consistently didn't get good yeah. enough good quality protein. And, and usually damn. low appetite. Too. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And okay. So that's, so there's two pieces and that's one of them. One is um, you, if I'm not eating all from these animal sources or I have digestive issues or whatever, I'm going to need to eat a little more than one gram of protein per pound of target weight, protein powders and supplements make that possible. And then two, what you just said, it's not easy when you're trying to eat in a surplus and yes. eat a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Because when it's all whole food, because yeah. it's filling. It's the most satiating macronutrient. Yeah. Try doing it. You might be able to do it for a few days. Try doing it for 90 days in a row. You'll find real quick that you ate your, you know, if I'm trying to eat 200 grams of protein a day, and I'm eating five meals of 40 grams of protein, after the third meal, I'm like, oh. With maybe more food, you know, mixed meals or even yeah, not more just filling. Yeah. You know, you add some fat into that. It yeah. gets more filling. You add some carbs. It gets more filling. Yes, yes. I, I know. I've been. It's tough. Yeah. yeah. So I think protein powders are, I wouldn't, they're not essential. But I think that they're a very important piece. Well, it's in this, again, going back to, and I want to keep, because I know people are going to like, chill. Well, you guys don't say that for this or that. It's like this this person that we're talking about right now who is struggling with building muscle and wants to build the most amount of muscle. This is a scenario where I am going to push a client in this direction. We just know it's going to be really about overall hard. health and long yeah. journey and this and that. I'm not really sweating if we have a week where we didn't really gain much as we are consistent with our other behaviors. You ate well overall. We yep. missed our protein and take a little bit. So fucking what? But this person who's like, I want to build the most amount of muscle in 90 days, like you're buying that. You yeah. need totally. to have that as a just a backup plan at the bare minimum. You need to have That's that. That's how I like and to And I like it. whey protein in particular because it's less filling than, say, casein. Uh, it's less filling. Is that true? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know yeah. That. yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So collagen, casein, egg, more satiety producing, which is good to P. know. P as well. P, yep. which is good to know if you're trying to lose weight. But if yep. you're trying to gain whey protein, you know, so long as you digest it well, right? Because if you, you know, like I can't have dairy protein, but for people who can, whey is, is the least uh, satiety, one of the least satiety producing. So for building, it's actually a really good protein. You Agreed. can add it to a meal. And it won't necessarily affect you quite much. Speaking of supplements, aside from, you know, protein powder and all that stuff, the one supplement, I'll make a statement that is not controversial, uh, but I, and I know everyone in here is going to agree because the data, the decades now, it's been over two decades or so, the data really clear with this. Creatine. Testosterone. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, take this. That no, too. Yeah. It's, it's creatine. Creatine is uh, one of the most, if not the most studied ergogenic um, supplement that is, exists on the market and it consistently uh, aids in building muscle. How do you feel about creatine and, and what does that look like? Yeah, creatine now, and I know you guys talk about this, uh, creatine, I think at this point, it's a supplement that everyone yes. should be taking. Yeah, it's good. Really. It's I mean, a so we supplement. could say everyone turn into, should turn it into should a multivitamin right. as far as like, that's how it's going to be. It's almost like a fish oil now. Yeah. Uh, in, you're not going to be getting enough creatine in your, well, that's not, maybe not enough, but let's say you supplement with five grams a day. That's the standard dosage for yeah. body comp and performance. However, research is showing that upward of 10 grams per day can benefit cognition, benefit brain health in healthy people too, yeah. not people who have problems. And so, heart health. Yeah. Try, try, try to get 10 grams a day through food. That's that ain't happening. That, that's not happening. Yeah, because I think it's that's like a pile what, of meat. Yeah, no, maybe like, Liver King can do that. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'm it's, not Liver King. It's, so on you're camera, only getting like one. It's yeah. one to three in like in like a whole pound of meat, right? Something I think like it's that. Three so grams. It's, if I'm not one, one sounds. That's why I said sounds, one to three range. Sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have to be. Eating. Yeah, creatine <laughs> is several, three pounds, several three, pounds. Yeah. Well, well, okay. So creatine is your body can synthesize creatine creatine through uh, amino acids. I can't remember which ones they are. Methionine. I don't remember the other yeah, one. Yeah, the ones that comprise it. Yeah, yeah but you're, but to, to get it from food, it's got to be animal sources because it's found in muscle. It's yep. found in muscle, uh, animal muscle tissue. So fish, beef, eggs, you know, you'll find it in, in turkey, chicken. So for the vegans out there, creatine is, in Have my opinion, is must essential. Yeah. Must. In fact, uh, the data on vegans uh, with creatine is they get a consistent Cognitive boost yep. from taking creatine. Yep. Now, this is probably because they're at a cognitive deficit from not eating creatine. So that's a, uh, I agree with you 100%. I think it's a must-have supplement 
for and, most and, people. And not not only for vegans, but for people who just don't eat much my much meat. My wife is like that. She doesn't really like meat. She's not a vegan or even a vegetarian, even though she just kind of tends to eat vegetarian because she'll do some fish, a little bit of chicken here and there, red meat. She just doesn't have a taste for it. Mm. And so I finally got her to just start taking here, swallow a couple of these creatine pills every day. It's good for you. Trust me. <laughs> You're into riding horses. You want to get better at that. You have to get stronger Yeah, here. That's what got her. She's like, all right, fine. <laughs> that's I'll awesome. You know, I, I, I put my, uh, my, put my parents on creatine yeah, because smart. of, because of its health benefits. Yep. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, well, the, all the biohackers talk about like uh, mitochondrial health, right? That's a big thing. Keep your mitochondria healthy. It, you know, reverses aging or whatever they like to say. Uh, creatine is uh, essential for mitochondrial health. It's the fuel that runs the cells of our body. So this yep. is a supplement I recommend to everybody. Let's talk about types of creatine. There's like 50 million types of creatine on the market. Which one is the one you should stick to? Monohydrate, yeah. right? I mean, that's that's the, the gold only. standard. Yeah. That's the one that Save has been- money. Yeah, that has been studied the most. And there are other forms that have shown to be about as effective as monohydrate, but you're just paying more money for nothing. Like, oh, creatine malate, creatine citrate, why? Yeah. Um, and then there are forms like s that that are probably inferior, actually. So you might be paying more for something fancy that's actually less effective than just monohydrate. I do like micronized monohydrate. It mixes better with water, It's which also means it tends to be easier to, to digest. That's not generally a problem, but some people do have that issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Creatine will upset their stomach. Micronized uh, can help with that. And that's, I mean- Any time of day. I, I wish as somebody who has a sports nutrition company, I, I wish I could say otherwise. I wish yeah. there were <laughs> Five some breakthrough <laughs> you know, form that, that can uh, live up to some of these claims that are made to sell some of these more- um, uh, designer kind of creatines, but it's, yeah. it's now considering you are biased because you are a su supplement pusher. Uh, is there, <laughs> still, <I'm first> still. <laughs> is, is, is there actually, cause we actually, when we wrote okay. this list, we, we, we actually didn't ask your opinion on that one. And I'm curious that is, is there something else that you would push on this particular client? Or do you think a protein powder slash bars, which I'd fall in that same category yeah. and creatine really is the, is the bulk of what you would recommend. Yeah. That that's, that's really the 20% that's going to give you 80%, right? If, yeah. If somebody, unless had, you're lacking like a, a key nutrient. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so I guess you could say eat plenty of nutritious foods, add in a high quality multivitamin supplement, but that's not really for the purposes of muscle building per se. I would say that's just kind of smart living. Yeah. Um, and if somebody had the budget and the inclination, you probably could make an argument for adding something like beta alanine, yeah. adding betaine, adding citrulline. But now we're into that um, Get you know, a little bit. 80% that can only give you that remaining 20%. Yeah, very, very well said. All right, what about carbs? Carbs. Um, a lot. Are, yeah, so, so, <laughs> so the, what role do carbs play in muscle building? Um, obviously, carbs will help you hit that caloric surplus. Yep. Carbs are the least satiety producing macronutrient. So when you get to that point where you feel like- I would like, say fat, actually, if you look if you look at- Interesting. So tell me about this. Right, calorie per calorie. Uh, yeah. as, an, as an individual macronutrient, um, I've gone through some of this research just in, in my writings and in, in my podcast. Uh, protein is, is at the top. My understanding of the research, protein at the top, followed by carbohydrate, followed by dietary fat when they are separated. So if you are having oh. a, like a pure protein, which you can basically do with protein powder, like yeah. my protein powder has zero grams of fat per serving, maybe one gram of carb. It's basically just protein, right? right. Um, or if you looked at just kind of a pure carbohydrate food or something that is basically pure fat, um, and that pure fat is going to be the least filling. So now, think of like olive oil. If you just like drink a couple hundred calories of olive oil. Yeah. Now, now, okay. So now maybe this way, this is why fat. We start to past, mix it though. There you go. Yep. This is why, this is why I think fat in the past was considered to be the second most satiety producing macronutrient because rarely yeah, you eat fat by protein. itself. Like True. who the hell, and, and besides research. me, because I'm Italian, who the hell drinks olive oil? Yeah. 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 Like out of a glass? I mean, people, people will eat, um, but do they eat avocado by itself? It's avocado toast, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, right. so, so it's, 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 it's a good point. That. And there's some, you know, it's not just fat. It's primarily though. Yeah. You know, I don't know the macros is off my head. Oh, but I do. There's probably Avocado's got a decent amount of carbs in it. So oh, okay. Yeah, it does. So, yeah. It so then has, uh, yeah. debunked myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, not a but, lot, but it has, it's definitely not just a pure fat. Um, research um, definitely shows. Example that, yeah, good yeah, example yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, research definitely shows that adding fat 
to a meal increases satiety. So, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense because because yeah. fat by itself, pure fat, maybe we think it's satiety producing because it sounds gross. No, let's like let's we just said yes. butter, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't. Now let's I don't let's, know let's talk about um, some strategies though with carbs in particular because one of the things I remember when in, being in this situation trying to build as much as possible is uh, you want to eat as a ton of carbs. I think we all agree on that. But uh, what I have to be careful of is that I don't fill up on that first before I get my protein. So I still have like this order of operation. That hierarchy. I go, I, when I look at a meal, I go, okay, let me get my protein in. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy a little bit of my carbs with it, but it's like, that's, I got to accomplish that. Yep. And then I want to like pile on my carbohydrates kind of after that. Do you yep. guys feel the same way or like, how's your- And how's, supplementation helps with that too, to your point where you're like, all right, uh, I wouldn't recommend somebody, my general recommendation, I don't know about you guys, but is uh, don't get more than 50% of your daily protein from powder. Like make sure you're oh, eating right. food, but let's say you're going to do that, right? So that that becomes easier, especially with whey protein because yeah. it's not very filling. Um, but as far as like sitting down for a proper meal, uh, yeah, exactly the so, point. Well, going to but your then you have to engineer those meals too, to this point of satiety and how fat affects things. And even in general, I, I'd be curious to hear your guys' thoughts after we after we wrap up on carbs. I would say ideally we would keep our fat, not low, but we would keep it um, certainly not over a hundred grams of fat per day, probably in the range of, depending on the size of the person, if it's a smaller woman, it might be 50 or 60. If it's a medium sized dude, it might be 80 ish, but trying to go high protein, very high carb, moderately, maybe a little bit lower fat. We'll get to that, yeah. but I do want to make a comment around that. Um, if you're trying to gain and you're getting a lot of your protein from whole natural foods, tip, it's easier to get fats because they tend to follow along yep. the protein. I so actually don't spend a lot of time focusing on it, to be honest with you, yeah, because you I see. feel like they kind of, if you're doing a good job of getting your protein yeah. source from whole Especially foods, animal protein, and you're unless eating, you're eating like just and you're eating, chicken and breast, you're right? eating carbohydrates, you know, like rices and sweet potatoes and quinoa and you know pasta things. If you're eating them like that, then fats kind of yeah. Especially if you're trying to make food that you like to eat because fat gives flavor, and so any any recipe yeah. of anything worth anything has some oil in it. Or right, that, and I feel like that between that and some avocado here and there, I feel like it kind of naturally yeah. falls into. Let's talk about the carb protein with olive oil. Yes. Yeah. Let's Let's go back to the carbs. You mentioned a few, uh, Adam. What have you found, um, Mike, to be some of the best sources of carbohydrates through the people that you've worked with and even your own experience in, in this context? So um, now, in, uh, how many how many carbs? Though maybe we should just. I don't think we've we've given them that yet. Oh yeah. Like, so what's the what, what, what are we talking like? about here? I think yeah. I think we're all in agreement that a high carb approach yes. is good. But how high is high carb? Yeah. Something that. Uh, you know, I, I, I get asked about and why, like, why am I eating? Why, am, like my recommendation, and I'd be curious to hear your guys' thoughts, is it needs to be at least two grams of carbohydrate per pound of body weight I, per I would day. Agree. And you might even want to go as high as four grams, depending on how active you are and personal circumstances. I, I would agree. I, I, now, there's always an individual variance, yep. depending on how they make the person feel yep. and digestion. And I'm one of those people where, too many carbohydrates affect my digestion negatively, so I, I can't necessarily push them too high. But generally speaking, I, I agree with you. Um, I think uh, the more carbs, part of the, the value of that is they, they provide the energy and the strength that you want um, when you work out. And you're, you're going to be fueling some heavy, hard workouts. And I'm stronger when I eat more carbs. And Absolutely. I'm not the only one. You have your best that. workouts yeah. on your calorie best. surplus and high carb, yep. good sleep. You'll have yeah. your best workouts. Yeah, you get life. the best pumps. You get the best fluid in your muscles, which you know we talked about earlier. That's part of your lean body mass. But besides that, when you can drive more fluid into your muscles, that also sends somewhat of a muscle building yep. signal. The, the the cellular swelling effect. Yeah, 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 and it's and you know try going try getting a good pump even on a calorie surplus on a low carb diet. It sucks. Yep, you just don't. So higher carbs uh, just seem to work better for most people. So, so I, I completely agree with so that. So, I mean, I like this conversation because I actually, I couldn't even tell you what my actual grams were when I'm in a bulk. When I'm in a bulk, it's basically protein and calories. And then I allow myself to split carbohydrates and fats. Mm. How my day feels really. And yes, I, I take into consideration, I've got a big workout coming in a couple hours. So I want to eat, you know, a few hours, normally two meals is what I like to have before that workout. 
but I would allow myself to to basically go back and forth on days on maybe one day I'm uh you know more for 30 you know 30 percent well got more fat that day the next day it's down to 10 and yeah. you know so I kind of let it ebb and flow like that so long as my calories and that's what I'm really focused on my total calories and my protein intake when I'm trying to gain I allow that that flexibility to happen I really get into carb manipulation in the cut more than I do in the bulk just personally I just I have found more success and I've actually found point. I've also found mm. more success with that with my clients because they don't have like this number they have to hit it's just listen hit your protein intake hit your calories yeah. and then you know balance Let the carbs it. and fat fall where they yeah. may yeah now right. I'll say though if we're speaking to somebody who is trying to gain that 10 pounds or gain as many pounds of muscle as they can in 90 days I would still recommend that they pay a little bit more attention to their okay. carbohydrate intake than that simply because if we are on a deadline and we do know that high carb is better for building muscle i mean this has been shown in research and this is there's tons of anecdotal evidence to support this as well a lot of people who have been successful at this stuff will tell you more carbs is better when you're trying to to gain muscle so in that case would you would you because then i'm always trying to think what's the simplest way for my clients to, to, to is would you give them like a a bottom threshold basically like make sure yeah, I think ranges are always yeah. the so way the two to, go to, with. to two grams per pound of yeah. target body weight as, as high as, as upwards as, as four. Yeah, probably yeah. that'd be a bare minimum. Yeah. And I would I would like to see them closer to four than to yeah. two. There's a few theories as to why, by the way, when the calories are controlled, why higher carbs tends to build more muscle. One of them is the energy uh, that you get for your workout. So the workout you're, you're able to train with higher volume in terms of weight and reps. Another one is just the fluid. That flows into muscle glycogen. You store more of it. You tend to hold more water. That sends muscle building signal. There's some theories that's, that revolve around insulin. Insulin is, uh, b believe it or not, the most anabolic hormone that exists in the body, even more anabolic than uh, testosterone. Um, it literally drives tissue growth, including you know fat, but also muscle. So there's a few theories as to as to why. But anecdotally, um, I mean, weightlifters, bodybuilders, strength athletes have known this. They've known this for a long time. It's always been kind of what they've seen that they just build more. And I'll attest to this. I mean, mm -hmm. when I eat more carbs, I'm just stronger and I build more muscle. Um, but I do tend to, as a lifestyle, do what you do, Adam. Yeah. If I'm trying to cut, that's when it becomes more important. But if I'm on a deadline and every, and we're all in here and we put money on the table, let's see you can build the most muscle in 90 days, then I'm going to do what you're saying. Yeah, I think what mine looks like is it's still, I just give myself a bare minimum. Like I know that like I've learned that kind of, you know, total grams for the day where that needs to be like in order to hit like, so for me, it's, let's say it's like 150 grams minimum. I need to, to feel those, feel that way when I work out, it yeah. feels like my body's building. So I still allow the cards to fall, however. However, I keep in mind that this is my bottom threshold, as I would do with fat too. Like fat, I don't want to be under 20 grams of fat for a total for the day. Like you get in the unhealthy territory. Yeah. So I have this like, okay, minimum grams of fat, minimum grams of carbs, let the cards fall wherever. You yeah, know, that's kind of how I like I find that as a and as long as I'm pushing those calories and that protein that's intake. That's generally my advice. A, yeah, generally my advice too. It, it, because usually I'm not in the a situation where I'm like 90 days, maximize muscle growth. Right. That's well, even career. in that, I mean, so that's I mean, I like that Mike's bringing that up because it's an interesting point because you're right like if we are trying to maximize uh every day that does make a little more sense to be at least have like bare minimums because yeah. if not then we potentially are yeah. we're slowing down this process yeah. yeah so now I, as far as carb sources i've always mm. because carbohydrates make up the bulk of the food that you're gonna eat just just volume wise digestibility yeah. for me is number one plays a bigger like, role, like okay say. what source volume too because remember volume is really what drives satiety yeah and you, that's great when you're cutting and and you're you're thinking okay i'm gonna have a big salad every day <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you know i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna, gonna get have, all my carbs from broccoli I'm yeah. Gonna, yeah or i'm gonna you know i'll, I'll recommend people to, uh, make make some vegetable soup zucchini seems to work particularly well for this right when you're cutting it's it's a lot of volume not a lot of yeah. calories it fills you up and you can use, you know, drink drink plenty of water. There's some research research to show that carbonated water might even be better for uh, satiety. inducing satiety. Yeah. Now we're gonna have the opposite problem though with what we're talking about. That if somebody if they try to eat quote unquote really clean, let's say it's uh, a guy and he needs to eat, and I and I I'm, I've been here myself, four thousand calories a day. That's where you're at at this point to continue gaining weight, continue gaining muscle and strength, and you try to eat nothing but. Um, relatively unprocessed, highly nutritious food, all 4,000 calories every day. You can do it, 
but it is not it enjoyable. Yeah. You know, I've done it. It is not nice. The, so you might want to swap that whole wheat bread for white bread, or you might want to swap that whole wheat pasta for white pasta. Yes. Uh, don't, I wouldn't recommend deleting vegetables and fruit from your diet, but you might not want to have that three servings of fruit and six servings of vegetables every day. You might want to go down to one or two servings of fruit and maybe two to three Here, Here's some of my of here's some of my favorite sources of carbohydrates coming from somebody who uh, is is has sensitive digestive issues when it comes to carbohydrates. I found white rice. Now I find that for most people to be one of the easier digesting sources yep. of carbohydrates. Very dense, very starchy. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I like white rice, buckwheat, and I like I like buckwheat uh, cereals. What I mean by that's hot cereals, uh, grits, really easy to get. Lots of starchy carbohydrates. Yep. Um, potatoes can be good, but believe it or not, some, very yes, filling, you push the potatoes and you're like stuffed. And a lot of people don't realize potatoes white do potatoes, that. sweet potatoes, not so much for me. I don't feel as much like easier white to digest. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sweet potatoes. I feel like I can, I can eat. Isn't a lot, that funny? Lot. Because they say we tend to think it's the opposite. I agree with you. Right. Sweet potatoes. I can digest more than I can with white potatoes. Oatmeal has worked well for uh, me. I can, I can eat a, a lot of oatmeal, oatmeal. rice. Sweet potato, quinoa, yams, um, and I, and then I, I, when I'm on the bulk, I do allow bread, even though like it's like sourdough bread, like it becomes like a staple for me in the morning yeah. with my breakfast. See, because okay. you can supplement, so to speak, a meal. You can add 50 grams of carbs pretty easily with bread, yep. uh, and and not feel all that much fuller than without the bread. Yeah. yeah. Now, unless you're someone like me, right, where uh, gluten containing carbohydrates bloat the shit out of me. So if I threw bread in, I'm going to ruin the next couple meals. GF, bro. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm legit. I legit will have issues. I'm yeah, not I'm saying do the gluten. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. Sour, did, sourdough doesn't sourdough affect you that way. Real either. sourdough. Yeah, real I sourdough. I, I, I feel a major difference in like freaking Wonder Bread. Yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's right. easy to add to breakfast or lunch. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about fats. Let's go back to fats. Yep. I like to tell people with fats to not be afraid of them, basically. So not necessarily aim for like all these fats, although it's easy to add calories and fats and in, in the, uh, from like things like butter and uh, especially olive oil. Like when you eat your vegetables, if you're having trouble hitting your calories, like one tablespoon of olive oil, which is nothing, yep. is 100 calories. Yep. You can throw four tablespoons on there, no and problem. It's, it's great fat. It's healthy fat. Very healthy fat, easy to digest, great for the body. Um, so I tell people, don't be afraid of fats in this case. You're trying to build the most amount of muscle. Don't worry about limiting your fats. I'm not necessarily saying aim for super high fat targets, but don't stay away from them. So when I'm hitting my protein targets, like we said earlier, I'll, instead of telling people, oh, get lean sources of protein. It's like, look, we're trying to bulk. Mm -hmm. Instead of going for chicken breast, go chicken thigh, yeah, right? Instead, instead of, of the 90-10, get the 80-20. Yeah, great. yeah, yeah. And that's the that's the main thing that I like to say with fats. How about you, Mike? Don't be yeah. fat Same phobic, thing. Mike. <laughs> oh, that's that's what they meant by fat. Phobic that's what there, there is uh, there is one. I have phobias, but fat is not one of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the one thing, though, I would say to to challenge that a little bit because what I have seen and I experienced this myself and with with clients that can get out of control really quick, and for some weird reason we justify it as like this this health food, and we also think it's a protein when really it's a fat, and that's nuts and seeds. Oh yeah, yeah can yeah, get yeah. out of control yeah. really quick. Peanut butter is a horrible oh, yeah. source of protein. Yes, Peanut unfollow anyone who says otherwise. Yes, that's a diet hack, right? That's there. <laughs> no, no, you're right. And, and even something that is a better choice, like almonds. I mean, if you ever seen how much you need, I mean, like all you need is like Those one snacking all day. Oh yeah. You can easily answer. crush, you know, four or 500 calories on that of, of mostly fat. Oh my God. Like, five minutes. Yes. Yeah. Really, really easily, quick. Yeah. So I, that, that would be my That's one a few handfuls. I mean, you're a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I remember when I first, uh, figure this out like why what i was having this problem i'm like why am i just getting so fat like i'm putting on way too much body fat for muscle and i was i used to keep this jar of peanuts that and that was like my way of and that was my my excuse was oh it's a healthy fat and has some protein and so to help keep my calories up 800 calories later oh yeah we can all vividly remember the disappointment of the moment when we realized how little a tablespoon of pro of <laughs> yeah. uh, peanut butter actually is yes. you know what i mean because yes. it's like, so good yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah whatever it's it weighs whatever like 18 to 20 grams right and then yeah. Our tablespoon previously was like 50 grams. Yeah. And then you're like, shit, that's like three tablespoons, <laughs> yeah. actually. I know. So All true. right, so let's talk about something a little more controversial. This is something that I communicate. One thing with fat, yes. though, I think we should uh, at least mention is saturated fat. I, yeah. I do recommend, uh, this is the standard recommendation, to not let your saturated fat exceed 10% of your total daily calories, especially when your calories are quite high. And uh, the body of the evidence 
um, Boy, thank you for saying that because it doesn't make L- as big LDL, of a difference when your calories heart, are low. Uh, heart health. Yeah, when your when your calories are low, this doesn't make that big of a difference. When you're in a surplus, yeah. the types of fats that you eat uh, and sugars, for example, actually make a difference. Yeah. Your calories are under your what your maintenance is. If you're losing weight, eh, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Now, Especially I will, if you're a small person already. Yes. Now, I will say this. There's a pretty wide genetic uh, variance with this. Like, for example, me. I'll go on a bulk. I mean, I eat shit. I eat 10 eggs a day. I only eat, that's beef is my number one source. It's rare that I eat anything other than beef. Uh, I eat butter and stuff like that. My cholesterol, my blood lipids are like, every time I get them done, the doctor's like, this doesn't make sense based off what you're telling me. This is incredible. Um, So there is a bit of a genetic variance, but generally speaking, the data is clear. The key is, you're getting blood work done and you know that. Right. If you don't know that, yeah. um, you know, it, it's a it's a, a bell curve, right? Yeah. So whatever that is in the Proceed middle of the distribution, caution. that 60 to 70% of people are not going to respond like that. Right. With their saturated fat intake going up, 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 LDL, cholesterol goes up, up, up. Yep. Risk of heart disease goes up, up, up. Yep, so yep, yep, yep. Absolutely. For most people, they just can't get away with that. That's right. Um, now, things like grass-fed meat, um, uh, the not free-range eggs, but what do they call pasture-raised eggs, actually makes, when you're eating a lot of calories, makes a bit of a difference. If you look at the fat, the types of fats that they have, you see that grass-fed meat has a little bit of a better uh, fat profile. Yeah. And pasture-raised eggs, a little bit better yeah. of a fat profile. And then, you know, fish. Fish is great. Yep. You want to eat a, a, a nice protein good fatty, you know, calorie yep. source. Get like, some omega threes in. Yeah. And you can throw that in there. All right. Now let's get to something controversial. I was going to say, which is this is when I recommend that, you know, people can throw in the occasional quote unquote, I hate to say this junk food. Okay. Here's why treat meal. That's what I call it. Now. <laughs> yeah. Here's a instead of cheat meal. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now here's why it's hard eating in a consistent surplus day in, day out. And we're doing this for 90 days. This gets really hard. This is where, the, the, the bad part of junk food, the fact that it's so, that it overrides satiety, that they, they've designed- so many calories packed into so little food. Yeah, they've done, they've done such a good do- job of engineering this food to make us overeat. This is why the obesity is my number one reason. This is why I think number one reason why we have obesity in modern societies. Well, now we can use that as- Are you sure as, it's not the patriarchy? No, I'm pretty sure it's not that. Thanks, Mike. I was, I was like, can we do a whole episode without Mike <laughs> saying something? We almost made it. <laughs> Impossible. You Impossible. know, he's like the- uh, I'm behaving. Come you know, I, you've seen Super Troopers, right? Before where you yeah. like insert like that. That's so, yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going to get it in there. I'm going to get it in there. I'm going to get it in this Mind Pump episode I was directing sure. this. Yeah. Like, I'm going to keep them away. Yeah. No, so this is where I think uh, the dangers of high, ultra-processed foods, you can utilize- to your benefit a little bit. If you're struggling on some days to eat extra calories, well, you know, the ultra processed, whatever, so long as you're hitting your proteins and your calories are good. Well, now it's easier to hit your, you know, like you were doing 4,000 calories a day. I don't think people realize how hard that is to do on a day in day out basis. Yeah. Do you have any favorites? Uh, before I would go there personally, I would drink calories. Like I would, oh, and I was doing good. that. I was drinking a few cups of milk, uh, every day, for God, example. Earth's, this is like 120 nature's, calories yeah. per cup, whole yes. milk. Yeah. And, the and ultimate hack. Drink uh, a yeah. Glass and, of milk. and so I would, I would prefer that over, um, fruit juice, but I think fruit what about juice like pizza is rolls? also, um, uh, <laughs> when I was like 16, yeah. uh, mom, hot pot, yes. literally. Yeah, <laughs> think about what was that Cartman in one of the uh, yeah. South Park. <laughs> yeah. uh, I just made it a rule. I just made it a rule yeah. that I had to hit my my protein intake first before I would indulge in something like yeah. that. So that yeah. was like what I didn't want to do, which I see people do when we when you kind of, when you give a client or you give someone this option is they they now build this, in this the, goes to the first thing yeah they or they build it in it's like oh you know i need 50 more grams of protein oh i'm gonna go get myself that you know double bacon cheeseburger from five guys with the french fries and the milkshake and all that stuff like that and it's yeah. like no i want to i want to try and hit my my protein intake my healthy fats i want to get that in a, in a good amount of carbs like the minimum we were yeah. talking about i want to get that from all my my whole whole foods foods i've prepared for myself and then once i hit there okay go ahead and yeah and, this is what i and, this is like my cheek this is like where i'll use my little cheat code where you know I, i'll get a client that's like struggling man so i can't eat three thousand calories day in and day out some days it's almost impossible then i'll say okay what's a food that is irresistible to you something that is really hyper palatable to you and then we'll see if we can use that as a strategy to hit those caloric targets for me it's a burger I can almost always eat a burger. French fries is up there as well. Now, they're obviously not great, the best foods, 
But if I'm having, if I'm really struggling hitting my calories, you know, I can almost always eat a burger and fries yeah. and be, and I'll be able to eat them no matter yeah. how full I feel. Do you have any favorites for yourself? Burgers, pizza, okay, um, pasta. I really like a good pasta. Oh man, after it, my, my, my heritage. Yeah, That's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially if you make it the way you like it. Yeah, 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 right. But even, even that, that was my second dinner that I, I mentioned uh, previously when I was last lean bulking was pasta that I normally love. And after though, even a month or so of doing that every day, my second dinner of pasta, I was forcing it down. So um, may, maybe maybe a better strategy would have been to rotate through some of these other foods as opposed to just sticking to one that I normally really like and then just kind of beating the joy out of it, <laughs> <laughs> you know? No. Uh, what, what, how about things that you guys would actually like avoid? Like, so something I did when I was younger that I wouldn't do now is I, I would in the past justify, a, you know, a box of Mike and Ike candy where I yeah. would want something that at least had, like a burger and fries is great because there's some serious nutritional value in there. Yeah, especially not- if you, if you, I mean, I don't know if we're talking about the drive through or I actually prefer make yours as far as the burger goes. Yeah. I think you can make a better hamburger at home than you can get at a drive through. Yeah. Great point. You know, mm-hmm. make a homemade, incredible grass fed beef burger that you got avocado yeah. and bacon yeah. and everything on yeah. and enjoy. And then, and you're getting some, some really solid nutritional value versus drinking yes. a, a thousand calories of, of soda. alcohol yeah. or soda or candy, Eating pop candy. tarts or something yeah. like that. So, that you see a lot. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of my, or, or my breakfast cereal right that was kind of my rule it was like it, it, it needs to have some what some, a great what a great point you're some making some right. good nutritional value but i can also enjoy myself i go about burger yeah. and fries is amazing here's right? one of my one of mine that you know i don't know if you could you would consider this junk or not but it's it's you don't necessarily think of this as like you know quote unquote healthy food but like homemade tacos i could eat that crap oh, yeah. I think that that's right in line with homemade hamburgers. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got your ground beef, your rice. You can even make a bowl. This is a nice bulking meal. Rice, ground beef, you know, some salsa, some avocado. And it's like 800 calories. cheese over that too. Yeah. Yeah. And you got like 800 calories right there. Good good amount of protein. So I like to use those types of hyper palatable meals when you're struggling. When you're struggling to hit those calories. Not every day or not as just, Oh, this is how I'm going to hit my calories, but rather, Oh, I'm having a challenge. Now we'll throw those in. Well, I actually will never actually do any breakfast foods like that because it's in the beginning of the day and I haven't proven to myself, I'm going to have a good day of hitting all my targets. So the, my quote unquote cheat or whatever meal we want to call this comes at the end always. Yeah. Like, like you did with your pasta. Yeah. yeah it's like, the, it's the last, it's yep. the last meal of the day that I'm, I'm getting to enjoy this. Yep. And it's, that's what I, it was and, my last thousand calories. Or that's so right. That it's my, and it's my reward for being on, on top of things early on. Like if you, you give someone the green light to go have what have these somewhere in their day and they start their day off of that, like the likelihood oh, no. that they're going to execute yeah. is just not there. Very so, good point. So it's always a late night. All right. Let's talk about sleep. This is something that I wish I knew in my twenties, because when you're in your twenties, you can make some gains and you could, I guess, live your life in spite of having terrible sleep, but you have no idea how much you're missing out when you finally do get good sleep. Sleep is such a big factor when it comes to muscle and fat, you know, muscle gain, fat loss, that it's as important as diet and training. And dare I say, can definitely be more detrimental with how shitty people's sleep are. So this, and this is something that it took me a while to figure out. Once I got older and I had to figure it out, then I was like, oh man, I wish I knew this uh, when I was younger. Any strategies uh, for you? I know this is something you struggle with uh, uh, as well with sleep. You and I have talked about this. Yep. Yep. I mean, just to, to comment on that, I mean, research shows that sleep deprivation, sleep insufficiency directly reduces protein synthesis. Yeah. So, I mean, coming back to that It'll kill your muscle games. building machinery metaphor, it, it, the, the machinery simply does not work nearly as well. When and and I'm thinking of one study. It only took four or five days of uh, not enough sleep. It, it was not much in the study. I think they limited them to four to five hours per night. But many people only sleep six six and a half hours right, yeah. per night. So we're getting close to that. And, and they do it for long periods of time. Exactly. Not just four days. Exactly. Yeah. And so there are other implications uh, related to recovery and performance and other things that are 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 problematic when you're not getting enough sleep, but then there is the direct effect of what you are getting out of that work that you're doing in the kitchen and gym. You're getting a, a fraction of of the gains simply because you are not sleeping enough. I know that we didn't 
order these in any sort of priority, but this is one that I did not un- really understand in my twenties. That you know, it, I if I could go back and tell my my younger self like this would needs to be towards the top of yeah. your list because sleeping enough is like a life hack. I mean, yeah. if you want to see what you're really capable of, start sleeping eight hours per night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah, it sounds silly, but it's 100 percent true. No, you, know, you figure this out sounds, when you have a baby. And I remember, <laughs> I remember, it's not that I didn't hear that back then. I remember hearing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not like this is like new science. You know, mm-hmm. oh, by the way, it's we've known this for a long time. It's just when you're you're that age, you're so stubborn and you think, oh, it's like that's an old. You're man. also kind of you're invincible. invincible. You are. Yeah. You're right. Because so, yeah. you don't you don't think you're that you affected. You can bounce back. You, know, yeah, you don't think you're that going. affected by it. By the way, you think you're invincible. You're not because no. it is impacting. Right. What, by the way, what you, you mentioned a study with four nights of sleep on protein synthesis. One night of terrible sleep dramatically affects testosterone. Dram- they'll show you one night of sleep, you'll lower your testosterone by a quarter yeah. or more the next day. Because, you know, men's testosterone levels react on a day by day basis, or you could even say on a, you know, you know, on a schedule of an hour by hour basis, yeah. one night of sleep guys in your twenties, you have one shitty night of sleep, add some alcohol. Oh, well now right. you're really screwed, right? Yeah, Alcohol has yeah. got negative impacts on, on that as well. So, yeah. um, ha- any strategies for you to help with your sleep? That you yeah. Found so about? we've talked about my sleep journey. Uh, when I was, let's say 10 years ago, I'm 38 now. So 10 years ago ish, <laughs> I, I had a good run. I mean, I was I was very busy. Um, I'm still busy now, but I was even busier then. Uh, and so I was getting up probably about 6.30, go to the gym, uh, work out, work all day, go home. I was doing cardio usually around 7 p.m. I would have caffeine before the cardio, sometimes you him bean if I was oh, wow. uh, cutting as wow. well. And then um, eat some dinner, get back. This was most weekdays, get back to work, uh, put in a couple more hours, get off the computer at probably 11 or so, get ready for bed. I'm in bed by 11.30, fall asleep in five minutes, blackout unconscious for maybe six and a half hours, seven hours, wake up before an alarm. And that was it. That was my life for yeah. five or six years. No, no effects that I was aware of. Right. Yeah. And, and if I look objectively, in that period, I mean, I gained plenty of muscle. I was able to get very lean, stay lean. I had a period of like I had swallowed the the, the star in Super Mario. I don't know. I just had <laughs> I had invincibility for a bit, right? Then um, first kid comes, it starts to get a little bit shakier, but still was pretty good. Second kid comes, and I, I remember it. Just it's it's like a flashbulb memory because it's I mean I have like PTSD from what I've <laughs> of of when it changed and I, it, it was after my daughter came and there was a point I was in Virginia and it was just one night I woke up several times at night and I was like that's weird it doesn't normally happen to me and from that point forward it was never the same and now I'm a lighter sleeper I don't sleep through the night literally ever uh, I'm always going to wake up at least probably two times. Let's say anywhere from one to three times wow. average is probably two. Um, uh, often it was, I'd have to pee. And one thing that has helped with that in particular is I realized that I was drinking more water than I actually needed to drink. It became a habit. I, you know, sit on my computer and if I'm, it just, my water was always there, just something a just to sip on, right? Um, and that's not necessarily bad for health, but it does train your body to have to pee. I mean, I had to pee every hour or two just because I was drinking a lot of water. And by being a little bit more conscientious with my water intake and not drinking too much water, now I don't have to pee every hour or two, which has helped my sleep. So I'm not like waking up having to pee. Um, But so, you know, for, for years now, my sleep has gone in and out of being okay, not okay. I mean, there would be some nights where I would wake up every hour, every hour Wow, I'd be up. Right. And you can stay in bed for eight or nine hours. You still, I, I wouldn't be a, a good podcast guest uh, yeah. if, <laughs> if that, if that was the last night. Right. And um, so I've, I, I tr- I've tried everything, every evidence-based thing you could try. I have not tried sleeping drugs because those can mess you up and I don't want to do that. Um, but I've tried every supplement you can speak of, every, you know, all the standard things that people talk about. And those things um, I think are definitely the checklist, like, okay, are you getting off screens at the appropriate time? Are you dimming lights at the appropriate time? Yeah, sunlight are during you, the day. Yeah. Are you doing sunlight during the day? Are you, do you have some sort of pre-bed routine that allows you to relax? Um, and are you trying simple supplements, melatonin? Are you trying, 
um, uh, valerian? Are you trying? Chamomile. Sure, chamomile, glycine, blah blah blah. I can go down the list. Yeah. Lavender, um, and so what I found is for me is all of those things they would help uh, to a degree, and then sometimes it was just as bad as it ever was, right? And so really, and I've only really discovered this recently is for me, it was actually just an imbalance between total stress in my life, including my training and recovery. I, I was simply uh, going overreaching. too hard and, and where it started, and this is kind of dumb, uh, that I didn't think of this before is, um, is in my training. So previously, uh, I would, I would have a certain amount of training volume and I then increased that training volume, which is fine. I increased it to, let's say about 15 to 16 hard sets per major muscle group per week, a lot of compound lifts, a lot of deadlifting, squatting, yep. puts a lot of stress on the body. But I also was wanting to stay lean. I also was wanting to keep my six pack. Coming back to what we've been talking about, I was unwilling to eat as much food as was required to recover from all of that training. And this is a separate topic. I won't, I won't, uh, or derail us onto onto this tangent, but but um, you know people sometimes might think that they are overtrained or they are excessively overreaching when they're actually just under eating. Yeah. That that's actually the only problem. Yeah. And trying to keep their body fat levels too low, which have negative implicate can they do. have negative Im yeah. implications in in various aspects of health and performance. Right? There's a healthy lean, and then right. there's a not un there's an unhealthy lean. Right, and and so. For me, that combination was, that's what was causing the problem. It was pushing too hard in the gym, not willing to eat enough food, because if you want to stay lean, this, this applies to men and women. If you want to stay pretty lean, like if you're a dude, you want to stay between eight and 10% body fat, which is okay. But if you want to do that, if you're a woman, you want to stay between 18 to 20% quite lean. Really what that means is you are going to be in a slight calorie deficit more often than a slight calorie surplus, right. because that's just, you have to err on the side of under eating, not sure. overeating sure. to, to stay lean. Right. And that gets in the way of recovery. That calorie deficit alone gets in the way of recovery. And so I was pushing myself harder than I could recover from in the gym. And then outside of the gym, what happened over the last 10 years is my life has gotten more complicated, quote unquote. I have two kids. I now have businesses and employees and I'm not complaining about any of it, but I actually just wasn't aware of the amount of stress that I was yeah. putting on my body because psychologically I felt fine. I could deal with it. And it was, it was more of a physical thing. So what I did was I cut my training volume down by 25%. So very simple in my workouts, instead of doing four sets per exercise, I cut it down to three. And, uh, Within a week or so of just making that change, I was immediately starting to sleep better. I was feeling more rested in the morning. I had fewer wakings at night and I, I started to restrict my calories simply because I wanted to see how my body now dealt with being in a calorie deficit with this reduced training volume, a little bit less cardio. Some days if I wasn't, I would just go for a walk or two instead of hopping on the bike and doing a higher intensity, not necessarily hit, but higher intensity right. cardio workout. And so by just bringing down the the physical training stress, it immediately improved my, sleep. in my sleep. Yeah. So for me, that's what it was. Yeah, it that, was so too and much that, stress. That's really the second, the next point. So sleep and stress, which are both connected because, yeah. you know, historically speaking, um, if you didn't get good sleep for most of human history, it, it was, it was very stressful because what does that mean? Well, it means you're probably not getting enough food or you're probably worried about predators. Yep. And so your body senses this. And what it does is it says, and what, your body's very good at this. Okay, we're under stress. Historically, throughout most of human history, that meant we didn't have enough food. That's what we probably stressed about the most. And so what it does is it says, store body fat and don't build so much muscle because muscle burns a lot of calories. Body fat is uh, safety. It's money in the bank. And so not having good sleep and being too stressed tips the balance towards fat storage and it moves away from muscle gain. So and particularly it, it through through increasing appetite. 
And, and there's research on And reducing this. movement. Yep. It'll make you yep. not want to move as much. And you, yep. you may think you're moving as much, but when they actually follow people around. When they stick them in a lab. Yes. Yep. They find that, yeah, you're still doing your hour workout. You actually sit around and don't move as much as yep. you normally well, do. Well, I want to add to what he's talking about with the reducing stress in, in regards to like training volume, because, and if you've listened to the show a long time, you've heard me talk about this, but that was one of the the, the biggest um, paradigm shattering moments I had was in my, I think it was around 24, 25. It was the most muscle I ever, I ever built over summer. And what it was, was simply reducing my training volume and frequency. I was just, I was training seven days a week, getting after it. I was playing basketball every single day for like an hour or more. I was wakeboarding. I was snowboarding. Yeah. Like I was just doing, I was yeah. also in my twenties. So I was going yeah. out on Friday or Saturday night sometimes. I mean, I was just, and again, thinking that I was so resilient, fine, but not figuring out why am I not yeah. building anymore? Why am I in this hard plateau? I'm putting the work and effort in. And I think that when you talk about this in particular client, uh, sometimes uh, less is more. Yeah. Sometimes backing off uh, the intensity and or volume or frequency of your training and prioritizing sleep and just limiting or bringing down the stress, total stress yep. is- I, And total I, stress is, it's important. Yes, that's right. Many people, if we're talking fitness, they think of just training stress. Right. And uh, they, they don't think about the emotional and psychological stress mm -hmm. that they're under outside of the gym and stress. that our body can yeah. only take so much stress. Of, of any variety. That's right. It's all, inner yeah. body registers it all as stress. Right. right. It's yeah. all in the same. Yeah. And and, uh, and sometimes this has been the the one little thing that has unlocked it for people that have hired me for this exact thing that just cannot figure out. I train hard. I eat, like I do. And it's like, oh, well, you, you're doing too much. Yep. And you actually just, yeah. you backing off a little bit and then, and then boom, all of a sudden the body by, responds. By the way, not to get too, too sideways with this, but there's lots of strategies to reduce stress. One of them is to cut stressful things out of your life. Sometimes that's not possible. You got two little kids at home. You're not going to be like, well, I'm out of here. I'm not going to raise these kids anymore. Because <laughs> I need bigger biceps. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so, so now, now studies will show this. Studies I'll show back, this. Timmy. That I'm reframing. Jacked. I'm going to be jacked. <laughs> yeah. Reframing how you perceive the stresses of your life make a profound impact on how your body perceives the stress. Um, what is, what does the data show that is a, a great strategy for that? Spiritual practice and spiritual practice. Now this can be meditation. It could be prayer. It could be as simple as turning everything off and being quiet in nature. Some people can treat that as a spiritual practice, but that can make the stresses that you already have less stressful on your life. And they find this, they actually find that people who, for example, attend church, uh, regularly and are around groups of people and have good relationships with other people who have similar stresses. So like I got kids, it's so stressful, but I have lots of friends. I have lots of kids that that same stress now registers as less stress in that person because of how they perceive it and how they frame it. So there's different ways to reduce stress, not just cutting things out of your life. And I want to say that because I think sometimes people are like, oh, it's my wife. I knew I should have left her or whatever. Well, yeah, good luck <laughs> thinking that's going to cut your stress out by you know getting divorced. I've done that. <laughs> it's, it's way more stressful than, than, than you think it is. It's a, it's a better way to just uh, lose half of your net worth. That's yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right. So the next point is- uh, Just to comment on yes. that and because- uh, you know, again, just, just putting in the context of what, what I shared, I totally agree with you. Um, but in, and, and I'm this guy and I know there are other people out there who are kind of like the hustler grinder type of people yeah. who are like, they, I, I didn't want to accept that there still is an absolute limit. Absolutely. hundred percent. No matter how many. And physical stress is pretty black and white. Yes. Well, and, so, I, and I'm glad you said that. Mike, you're not going to pray your way out of with, that. Again, going back to this avatar, but this, this person that we're talking about, they're more likely to be the trying to I do can more. Do it. Yeah. I, I can, can do, do more. more. I can do yeah, more. I can do yeah, more. Yeah. And so I think that that conversation yeah. is even I'm more referring important. more to like life stresses that you, when you examine your life and you're like, okay, my life is too stressful. Right. What can I cut out of my life? Well, a lot of times it's chaos, right? You just need to add more disciplines in your life to open up freedoms to create that kind of a de-stress. Such a good point because, again, you may look at your life. Now, training stress is very black and white, in my opinion. Uh, I'm working out too much for everything that's going on in my life. Let me cut that down, yep. see what happens. But when you look at your life, you're like, well, I got a job. 
Uh, I, it's not realistic for me to quit my job. Yeah. I have kids. It's not realistic for me to like not take them to school and sure. take care of them, yeah. do that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm in a long-term relationship that can be kind of stressful. Like, is it, you know, you know I, it, maybe not, it's probably not a good idea to, to break that up because that's probably worse. So my point is the other life stressors, there's a couple ways you can approach it. And it's usually a combination of things, cutting some stuff out and then reframing stuff. And the spiritual practices, the data just shows that that 40,000 foot view of your life, that's what spiritual practices do. Can give you do. perspective. Very good perspective yeah. and really make a big difference on how your body perceives stress. So okay. let's talk about the training. Next, next point. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, get strong at compound lifts. They just bang for your Move buck, the time the spent, like... You'd have to do three exercises to equal the benefit of one of these big gross motor movements in terms of yep. time spent and what you get out of them. And these exercises are multi-joint movements, and they tend to be things like squats and deadlifts and presses and rows and that kind of stuff. This is something that um, I, I, I think people need to hear more often because yep. there's so many exercises so many strength training exercises. You're limited on the total stress you could put on your body. You're limited on time. And it's like, yeah, you could do those four, you know, leg exercises. Yeah, yeah. You know, leg exercises. Or you could I mean, look, look at the deadlift. I, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is like kind of a talking point these days that yeah. uh, the deadlift is, it's it's not good for hypertrophy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and, my biggest uh, pet peeve and, right and, now. And if you're not a strength athlete, you have no place deadlifting. Yeah. The, 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 the risks are far greater than the potential. Rewards. I disagree ever. with all of that. I, all yeah. of it. it. Look at the deadlift trains every muscle on the backside of your body. Uh, Period. Which arguably yeah. so, is one of the most important things that the average person yeah. needs to focus most, on. Because right. we're, so, to, because we're so anterior yeah. driven. Especially guys. Yeah. I've actually tried yeah. to make the case that the deadlift is is more of the king than the squat is for that if reason. If I could do only one exercise, mm -hmm. it would be the deadlift. Right. Yeah. To counter and what you're doing. I like it. Uh, some days I don't like it. Uh, yeah. But I'm choosing that uh, not just because of my feelings, but like objectively speaking. Right. Uh, I think that it is the probably single best exercise that people can do. And anecdotally, the carryover, I've seen this time and time again. Somebody gains strength on a deadlift, they get stronger at rows, yep. they get stronger at pull-ups, they get yep. stronger at curls, they get stronger at all the exercises. That lower evolve. body too. Yeah. Yes, and their and lower body too. So these compound lifts, if, if you're looking at your workout and you're like, where should I place my focus within my workout – what exercises should I place my focus on? What exercises should I try to get strong at? Make it those compound lifts. The isolation movements are great. They can add some volume. They could add some, you know, they can be fun. Muscles. Get a biceps pump. Yeah. Yes, but but like I don't care if my curls go up uh, as much as I care if my squat goes up or yep. my bench press or yep. my or my, my barbell row. row or exactly. Yep. So okay, good. I'm glad you. And I know I, I've seen your programs and your workouts, and they're very well written. And you place a, a strong emphasis on compound lifts. Do you remember when you figured that out? By the way. Yeah, that, yeah, that's also one of those. It, it, you know, you have these moments that are epiphanies and <laughs> and, and like and understanding energy balance. That's one that yeah. and once you have that epiphany and you 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 understand that that body composition, it, it really actually does come down to calories in and calories out. You then you learn about protein, a little bit about macros, and that's it. And now you know exactly how to manipulate your body composition in whatever way you want. That's an epiphany. Compound lifts. That was an epiphany for my first probably seven years of lifting. I don't know if I ever, I don't think I did one set of the deadlift wow. for seven or eight years. Oh, me too. I remember, I remember squatting now and then if I really felt up to it on the Smith machine uh, and let's not even say squatting, let's say like quarter, maybe half squatting. <laughs> and, and so uh, then, then now I remember, so I'm starting to learn about the importance of barbell movements and dumbbells as well, but compound lifts and training to get strong on those, yeah. not resting one minute in between sets and just doing drop set burnout sets yeah. on barbell rows or something. No, you're training to get strong. It's a little bit different. And so uh, I had been doing these quarter squats on the on the Smith machine. Um, I think I got up to 405 for quarter squats wow. right? on the Smith machine. Cool, cool. It's a lot of courage and, admitting yeah. that right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so I'm learning about, I think I first learned about this from Mark Ripito, starting strength yeah. and learning how to squat properly. And there are some different methods, but I think his method is, is, is tried and tested Absolutely. for sure. And um, so, okay, this makes sense to me. Uh, I'm, I'm now over, I'm off the Smith machine. I go over to the, to the power rack and I had no understanding of like how difficult a proper squat is compared to a quarter squat on a, on a fucking Smith machine. Yeah, right. I load up four 
Oh five. Yeah. No, right. no, you did it. Yeah, I, I you didn't did know. Not. Oh my I god. I didn't know. Completely didn't different know. animal. Buried. Yeah. And and uh, I'm gonna do my. This is literally probably my first proper rep of squatting ever. I'm gonna squat. Four oh five. I'm gonna squat to hips. You know, and I'm wow. gonna get my femurs parallel. I'm gonna get those hips a little bit lower, and realized, oh, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get I get down and. And under and, and and there's no way. I mean, you put the gun to my head, you're gonna have to kill me. I cannot stand that weight up. Of course, right. And fortunately, I was able to bail without hurting myself. And that I think was actually the first time I ever bailed on a squat. So I didn't really know even how to bail on a back squat properly. Yeah. But I, I I put it over me instead. Oh, oh, oh my hurt. god! But so I didn't get you. hurt. I didn't get hurt. Wow! And uh, and move. so. And so, so that, so that was a moment. And then from there, I went down to 185 pounds yep. on the bar and barely got eight, I think. Uh, and so that's how my 405 quarter squat, uh, Smith machine, um, fiasco translated mm. to a proper squat on the barbell. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you also, you also highlight, I think why a lot of young men in particular, why they don't. And we, and we gravitate towards the machines yep. because it's, it's hard. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yep. As and it's shit. a bit more technical. Yeah. 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 And so I, and I know that that was the reason why I did people it. out of them pretty easily. Yeah. Yes. I, 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 and <laughs> yes, this is also Do why I feel I, like doing time. it. No. Yeah. All right. Not doing this it. This is <laughs> why I can't stand this movement. Like the one you, you mentioned with the deadlift and then people trying yeah. to, you know, push the, the hack squat and leg press instead yep. of squats. I'm like, that's such a terrible message for the, the young man growing up who's trying to build as much mus muscle as possible because I attached myself to those people back in the days. And that's what kept me from squatting. It's like, Oh, I don't need to. Yeah. I can just leg press or yep. Smith machine squat yep. and I'll get all the benefits. And it's not that you can't build muscle on those things. It's just you are missing out on so much more by not doing that. Like it's a, that's a that's a must for me that if I, you want to build the most amount of muscle in ninety days. I was I was, I was, I was signal. I was fortunate because it, it's like fifteen or sixteen. Uh, I I worked out next to a group of power lifters, and I was leg pressing and working real hard and admiring these super strong dudes. You know, lifting all this weight. And uh, one of them, you know, it's like, hey, what are you doing, kid? And I'm like, oh, I'm trying to build big legs. And he's, you know, kind of chuckled. He's like, why don't you come over here and work out with us? And it changed my life. I squatted and deadlifted. And that summer, I, I'm never, now, I remember I'm a kid. I'm, you know, you know, height of testosterone, puberty. I'm probably going to grow anyway. But I gained like 16 pounds of lean body mass that summer from squatting and deadlifting. Yep. And I remember all my pants got tight. You know, I yep. grew an ass and legs all of a sudden. And I never looked back. So I was lucky. That My I back that. benefited a lot from deadlifting too. Oh, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. tremendously, right? Yeah. So, do you remember the gains you got yeah, after starting? I do. Blew your blew your mind. Yep. I mean, that, again, we were kind of that. That is just one of that epiphany moment. Like, oh, this this is the way to do it. And yeah, you can find fringe cases of like, all right, well, what about this advanced natural bodybuilder <laughs> who is now struggling for his last three pounds of muscle? Um, here's an example. And this guy doesn't deadlift. Well, yeah, for that guy, it, deadlifting actually might not be the best use of his energy and his effort for what he is trying to do. It might make more sense for him to, instead of deadlift, break that up into four different isolation exercises. There are scenarios where uh, I think but the, that's dead, not the, the deadlift would be contraindicated. But, but that's but, way the exception. Exactly. Definitely not close to the rule. You, you also uh, avoid it then because like this kid also wants to build muscle and you normally have specific chest, back, arms, whatever they want to. And when you do the big compound lifts, it's harder to feel in a specific muscle and yeah. see the pump the same way I would if I were to go just yes. go pump up my quads yep. on leg extensions. Yeah. Go or, pump up my or pecs, you know, I'll hear right. something, oh, I don't really feel the bench press as much as yeah. the pec deck. Right. So I, that's the other challenge is because you you start to connect the, oh, I feel it more in this muscle. Therefore, it's it's working that muscle and I'm yep. getting more benefit. Yep. And that was a myth that I think I, yep. I've, I've fell into. Even though I'm weak as shit, actually. In this <laughs> I just get a pump. Nothing yep. really changes yes. other than like I look good for about an hour after. <laughs> After I train <laughs> yeah, and then I look yeah. like I don't even lift. That's funny. <laughs> All right. So the last point we kind of covered in the beginning, but I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, which was training your whole body. And I, when I say this, I mean, in terms of frequency of body parts, there's a few different ways to do this. You could do three body, three full body workouts a week, or you could train with a split, but kind of hitting every muscle group about three days a week is what um, I found to be the, 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 probably the right amount of frequency for most people for gaining 
uh, the most amount of muscle. Um, it allows you to practice uh, compound lifts more often. Um, it, it, you know, over, you know, you don't train in this endurance state as much as you would if you're doing it in one session. Um, and the studies seem to back it up. Is there anything else you want? Because I know we covered this quite a bit during the episode. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say that uh, before thinking about frequency, we we would want to emphasize progressive overload. There needs to be some type of progression in the program. Uh, we have to be continue. We have to be generating larger amounts of tension in the muscles over time right. to drive growth. And so you could have frequency set up properly. But if you don't have a good model of progression in the program, then sure. you could actually not see much of a sure. difference at all. Um, so so progressive overload, I would say would probably be number one. Then volume. Uh, research shows that progressive overload is the primary mechanical driver of muscle growth. Uh, but a second, number two, is, is probably volume. And you can look at volume in different ways. You can look at it total reps, total poundage. I like the hard sets. Um, um, model, I guess you could say, which is a hard set is simply a set taken close to muscular failure. Right. You don't have to go to failure in every set. Of course, some exercises like on the deadlift, I would not recommend that. Um, but you do got to push hard in your sets. You, do, you yeah. do have to get to a point where maybe you could do one or two more good reps on most exercises. If it's your first set of deadlift, maybe it's two or three good reps left, but you are getting close to failure. It is getting very difficult. That's a hard set. And so again, uh, research shows that the total amount of hard sets that you do for a muscle group per week is a major component, a major factor of muscle hypertrophy. So what that means is, and I've experienced this myself and, and I've heard from many people over the years, you can have great programming. You can do everything that we're saying. Uh, but if your program does not provide enough volume, if, if it doesn't, if you're just not working hard enough in the gym, uh, you are either going to um, gain less muscle and strength than you could have, or you're going to gain, you're not going to see much of a difference. You're just going to be stuck. Well, it's the difference between training and exercising. Right. You can go I to the mean, gym and exercise and do the same volume, same intensity all the time, and you're exercising still. But if we're training for a goal and we're trying to progress, then yeah. I like that. I've never I've never tried that. I've always uh, just added total volume, right? I just found that the easier for me. And I actually only would only pick like my big major lifts. Like I pick all my big major lifts, track sets, reps, weight, multiply them all together, get this total volume number. Yep. And then my goal was just to, I mean, by one to 5%. I don't even have to go that much. As long as I'm increasing by that one to 5% week over week. And I would see that nice, you know, consistent, yeah. you know, now, of course there's always diminishing returns. You can't do that forever. Right. At yep. some point you have to change the stimulus. That's how you get the body to, respond. you also, you, you can't increase volume forever. Like, right. Like no. we said, there's right. a point where you try to do more and you just get hurt. Yeah. And so, you have to think about progressing in terms of total reps, adding weight to the yeah. bar. Oh, exercise and then, selection. There's a lot, yeah, a lot there's of a lot ways of different ways. Slowing the tempo down. I mean, you know, where you squeeze. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but generally speaking, it's lifting more, doing yeah. more volume uh, yeah. type of deal. Now, Getting wanna, stronger really is the key. I think we should yes. emphasize that. Is Absolutely. That in these 90 days, uh, our primary goal is to get you stronger because research shows that when you're, when you're new, in your first year, you can gain a lot of muscle, um, almost irrespective of how much strength that you gain. There's not as close of a relationship between strength gain and muscle gain as when you are a more experienced weightlifter. And research shows that, that relationship becomes uh, much, much stronger in that it becomes really the, the primary method of continuing to get bigger is to continue getting stronger. And so yes. uh, this is why we want to emphasize the compound weightlifting. And we should also probably mention that we want to emphasize you need to be lifting heavy weights. That doesn't mean you have to be doing twos, threes, fours, and fives only, but it wouldn't be appropriate. And who wants to do this, but to try to do sets of 20 reps, 30 reps on the squat, for example. Yeah. I mean, again, who wants to do that? Yeah. Um, but I think a good general recommendation is, is probably something between and, and research shows that heavy weight that is effective for muscle building probably starts around 65% of one rep max. So maybe that's like about 15 reps. And, um, and then if you can, if you can work in some heavier work, particularly on the, on the compound exercises, which also is, it's more fun. It is more fun to do sets of yeah. four sixes or eights on a squat than, than 12 or and 15. I, and I well, I, add, well, well, here's the thing too, though. We, we, we set this up as a 90 day kind of a challenge. So I would even make it, I would make simplify it for the listener as 
one month I'm running a block of, you know, sure. Tens. You know, yep. Tens, yep. another time fives yep. and then 15s. Sure. Yeah. So the, the, I mean, and that would be a real easy way to do this first month. Yep. We're, we're, we're going all, we're doing fives second month. We're doing tens and 50 and you could order that. However you yep. want. I, I, mean, I, I personally recommend ordering it, starting with your higher reps and then progressing into lower reps simply sure. because my, my, my reasoning for that, I'd be curious what, what you guys think, what your experience is, is that uh, my understanding of, of research um, on fatigue, just, just the amount of fatigue that accumulates in your body is that that's driven more by volume than load. Oh, so they build the endurance, muscle so endurance. So in the beginning of your training it. block, when you're fresh, mm -hmm. uh, you want to you wanna do your high volume. That's your hard training on, that's just hard on your body. And as you get deeper into a training block, you want that volume, uh, you, you want the, the reps per set. So let's say you start with your 10 right? Like, you know, you guys know how hard a true, a good set of 10 on the squat, like taken close to yeah, muscular, that's, muscle fat. That's nasty. That's hard. Yeah. A, good, a, a good set of 10 on the deadlift is, that's the hardest thing I ever have done in the gym <laughs> is sets of 10 taken close to failure on the yeah. deadlift. I mean, it's cardio by the time yeah. you're in your third set or whatever, yeah. right? Um, so you would start with your 10s and then maybe progress into your eights or sixes simply because even though it, it can be counterintuitive because it's like, well, I'm putting more weight on the bar, that can be harder on your joints. But as far as systemic fatigue and sy systemic stress goes, the high volume training is actually harder on the body. Yeah. And I could make the argument, and, and I think it's very valid what you said. I could make the argument in the in the opposite direction in the sense that I, I tend to build my, my capacity for volume as I... I continue on a training block. In other mm. words, when I start with lower reps, my training, my ability to handle more volume starts to improve and then I add the reps and then I add more reps. But honestly, there's really no wrong answer. Well, yeah, I'll, 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 to add to that though, to I think to that you both would agree is what would be the most valuable is to know what that person was currently doing when you got a hold of them. 100%. I was just going to so, say that. Yeah. So, and we would all you agree. You can't just uh, double your, that's right. your, your effective volume. So we, that, we're, that's going to, and one of the you. easiest ways to start them on the path of seeing results would be to move them out of where they currently are. Yeah. So if I have somebody that who's training stimulus. in the 15, make it 10 or 20% harder, not 50, a hundred percent harder right. right away. Yeah. So, and also when it comes to intensity, um, I know we're talking about higher intensity, but the, the, the more of a beginner you are, the more detrained you are, the less intensity is required to get the body to respond. The harder or the more experienced you are, the more intensity. So if you're a total beginner, and you're listening to this and, and you're hearing, oh, get close to failure, like that's going to mess you up the first few weeks. Like that's really high from going from nothing to like, I'm going to squat 10 reps that almost to failure. Yeah. You probably want to go about like 50% uh, sure. and you'll gain, you'll sure. gain strength. You'll yeah. gain muscle. Almost like way. an acclimation. hundred percent, hundred percent. Cause intensity can be very, very easily overdone on, on a, on somebody who's, you know, untrained. Yep. Anyway, it's been a lot of fun. Mike, yeah. Yeah. great, yeah. great podcast. Pure fitness. We almost kept it pure fitness. A couple of comments. <laughs> only a couple. Only it's a couple. Close. Yeah, no, yeah. great time. And then you have a book, right? That's out. Yeah. What, what's the title of it? And where Mo do you get yeah. The yeah, yeah. Muscle for Life is the title of uh, my, my newest book. And that's particularly for men and women, uh, 40 plus, who are very new to strength training, new to all of this stuff. Whereas my previous books, like Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, are, are meant for a little bit of younger crowd. Um, and people who are ready to get in the gym right away, start squatting, start deadlifting, that, 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 that's appropriate for some people, but it's not appropriate for a 55 year old sure. woman who never is done anything. obese and yeah. has never yeah. done any strength training. You're not going to tell her to go and deadlift day one. Yeah. And so that's, that's obviously the, um, that's the biggest group of people that 40 plus male, female, brand new, they probably have a lot of weight to lose. They're not very healthy. They've never really done any of this stuff before. There are a lot more of those people who need help than like 25 year old guys who want to go from fit to jacked so they can get laid more. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Excellent. so that's uh, yeah, that's the newest good deal. Well, thanks man. We always talk about you as being one of the best uh, people in our space. So appreciate you coming on the show, man. Yeah. Thanks again for having me.